um, financially and with other kinds of resources, depending on the communities that they're in. But because they serve over half of our students, um, we want to make sure that the quality of the educational experience that students in neighborhood high schools have access to is just as good as that of any other high school in our city. Part of getting to this um, vision of really revitalizing neighborhood schools is also our belief that schools can be anchors in their communities and that when a strong school is a, a partner in a community, it can help to lift that community and revitalize the community as well, which is another uh, reason for our focus on those neighborhood schools. So what are we actually doing? So Generation All is starting with a planning process. We have a steering committee of about 40 individuals, half mostly our teachers, principals, and students from CPS. The other half are members of uh, community-based organizations that do advocacy work and education, um, that work with parents, also groups that provide services to students or to young people in Chicago, and as well, um, it includes people from the different city agencies like the libraries and the parks. And the vision of this steering committee is that it becomes the core of a growing coalition of Chicagoans that will really um, focus efforts and resources and support in support of our young people across the city, primarily through the neighborhood high schools. So the steering committee has been meeting since September, roughly for about once a month, and they are beginning to develop some recommendations for our city, not just for CPS, but really for the city as a community, to make some changes to policy and programs and practice that will elevate the um, quality of learning opportunities for students in and out of the classroom and in and out of their communities, but based through those neighborhood schools. This plan is something that we hope will be actionable, that really won't just be a set of good ideas in a document sitting on a shelf, but that is something that has support at both the city and community level and inside of our schools. Um, we recognize that the work of providing a top quality education that is holistic and that looks at students' development, not just academically, but personally, uh, it is not just the work of one school or even of the school district, but it is the work of the city. So as we build out these recommendations, we're going to take them out into communities through focus groups, through workshops, and in other ways to get input on them. And we hope that you will join us in giving us your feedback for, the, for those ideas so that when we are ready to release a plan, uh, we build some support and some commitment, not just at the um, kind of stakeholder level, but also at the policy level. Because we understand that this, this kind of work takes resources and political will as well as uh, community value. And so we would like you know, to, to align all those things when we're ready to release the plan. And finally, part of that public engagement has been this speaker series. So this is our third in a series that started with Warren Simmons from the Annenberg Institute. Uh, we also brought in Rebecca Wolf from Jobs for the Future to talk about student-centered approaches to learning and teaching. And today we are thrilled to have uh, Dr. Pablo Noguera here to continue the conversation about equity and urban education. We, as well, assembled a team of panelists to have a conversation with us, um, not so much to respond to what Dr. Rivera presents, but really to engage in conversation about these issues based on their local experience. Uh, we have a principal from Tilden High School, a teacher here from Wells, and two students who serve on our steering committee and really are, are pretty well informed and have some terrific uh, ideas and views about this work. So we hope that you enjoy the program, that you jump into the discussion, um, and that you take something away from here to follow up with, with our work. I'm going to show one slide that I'd like to, excuse me, to um, invite you all to join us on social media. We've had the privilege of um, working with the communications team that really helps us think about how to get the word out about this work and to create a dialogue across the city. So if you are on Twitter, we are really active on Twitter, and we'd love for you to follow us. If you'd like to tweet today, the hashtag that we encourage you using is Talk Generation All. And then we're also on Facebook. Uh, we have a great website with a great number of resources on there. And someone just started an Instagram account for us today. So we invite you to do that. You should have received a packet which has some basic information. Um, there's a Get Involved card in there, and we, now that you've registered for this event, we will add you to our, our list of um, emails for other events. But take the moment if you'd like to 
you have further involved to fill out the Get Involved card, and that's a way for us to make sure that we follow up with you. One last thing is that we have an idea of all up in the room on the back. When you registered, you were asked to give us an idea for how, what our city and our communities could really do to strengthen um, education for young people in the city. Many of you um, did take the time to fill that out. If you have other ideas around that, you have the um, opportunity to put those up on the idea wall. And we encourage you to do that. Okay, so now I would love to uh, move us along so we can get to the, the heart of the program. I'm going to introduce our moderator for the rest of the evening, Sarah Howard from the Network for College Success. Thank you. Hi everyone, how are you? Hi. Glad to see you, welcome. Um, it's my honor to begin by introducing our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Noguera is a professor of education at New York University and the executive director of the Metropolitan Center for Research on Equity and the Transformation of Schools. Uh, he also happens to be a member of the Generation All Advisory Council. Um, but what I want to point out about him is that he was a classroom teacher in public schools in Providence, Rhode Island, and Oakland, California. And while in California, received the California Distinguished Teacher Award in 1997. Um, so we appreciate that he continues to wear his teacher hat as he engages in this work. And um, he's widely published, relentlessly servicing and exploring issues of equity in school. We're excited to add his voice to this dialogue about building strong neighborhood high schools in Chicago. He brings a broad perspective from decades of working with schools and districts and a strong love for students. Uh, if you listen to him for five minutes, he's going to talk about a kid. Um, he's not here with a prescription tonight, but to engage us in thinking about what's possible in very concrete ways. Uh, one thing that I appreciate is often when we hear academics talk, they paint a beautiful picture and the reality that I taught him never seems to be in the picture. Um, and so I appreciated, just even today, his acknowledgement of constraints and challenges that we face in large urban districts as we're working for that. Um, so looking forward to hearing more. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pedro Thanks, sir. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank Sarah for the introduction, thank the principal for hosting us. Great to be a name, in a school named after Ida B. Wells. Uh, really proud of that. Um, and thank you to Generation All for organizing the event. I'm pleased to serve on the advisory board. Hopefully we can help in trying to help this city get the kind of schools it deserves uh, for its kids. And I know that's not an easy task, uh, especially now because we ask schools to keep doing more and more with less and less. <clears throat> so let me start by just saying this, that my remarks are going to be about how do we ensure, as you see there, that we're making high standards available to kids and so that kids can engage in powerful learning. Because I think if we're serious about helping a generation of young people get to college, then we also got to be serious about giving them the tools so they can be successful there. And right now we have ample evidence that not only we, we're not doing that very well. You know, in New York City alone, 80% of the kids who graduate from high school and pass the test have to take remedial courses once they get to college. Right? Because they really aren't prepared academically. And that says everything about what's happening or not happening in the schools they're in now. So I'm going to explain why. And one of the big factors here is the way policy has limited um, our ability to do what we know needs to be done to serve our kids. So I want to acknowledge the constraints. At the same time, I do want to say that um, the despite the constraints, there's a lot we got to do, okay? And uh, I'll give you some examples today of schools that are doing just that. So this is not simply a theory, but uh, in fact, the book that's out there identifies schools and districts and classrooms across the country that is showing us it's possible to get excellent results for all kinds of kids, right? even in these very difficult and challenging times. So let me start by saying that one of the big constraints is inequality. 
Um, and, and inequality, I often like to remind people, is more powerful than equity. Because everything in our society is moving in the direction towards greater and greater inequality. And anybody who doesn't realize that that's also an educational issue doesn't understand education and certainly hasn't worked in Chicago public schools. At the same time, equity is important, but equity is one of those terms that gets used a lot. And because it gets used a lot, it's easily confused. So let me be very clear about what I mean by equity. It means addressing the needs, both academic and social, of kids so they have a chance to be successful. Right? Hungry kids don't do that well in school. Right? Neither do kids don't have a stable place to sleep at night. Right? It also means trying to compensate for disadvantages. We talk about building strong neighborhood schools. You're going to have to build schools that can mitigate the effects of poverty. Right? Mitigating is not the same as solving it. Schools can't solve poverty. But if a kid doesn't have a coat in the winter, especially in Chicago, we better get him a coat, right? Otherwise, they're not coming to school. It also means recognizing that all kids can learn, but they don't all learn the same ways. They learn differently at different paces. Anybody who has more than one child, anybody have more than one child? Raise your hand. I got five. They all walked at different stages. They talked at different stages. They read at different stages. This idea of average yearly progress, rooted in no child behind, is at odds with everything we know about child development. Because right? any doctor will tell you there is no standard norm for what a four-year-old should do or a seven-year-old or a 12-year-old. There's a spectrum out there. And lastly, <clears throat> equity is about staying focused on outcomes. Right? Outcomes because we want all our kids to get an education that will prepare them to lead productive lives. That's absolutely important. Again, as a parent, isn't that what you want for your children? Especially to have your children live productive lives away from you at some point, right? That's what we all want, right? Because that's part of helping them to become independent adults. So that's what equity is about. Same time, we live at a time in this country where poverty rates are growing, particularly amongst children. Some of the highest child poverty rates we've ever seen in this country right now. Okay. One out of five, in some places one out of four. Michigan has some of the highest child poverty rates in the country. The highest rates of all are in the Inland Empire in Southern California. Not surprising, also the place that has the highest mortgage foreclosure rate. And so poverty is a huge obstacle in this work. At the same time, so is policy. Because we pursued policies that, for one thing, have ignored the needs of our kids. Isn't it ironic that we have a law called No Child Left Behind, a slogan that was adopted from the Children's Defense Fund? But when Marion Wright Edelman came up with the slogan, she wasn't thinking that we should simply test kids as frequently as possible. In her mind, it was about nutrition and health and child well-being because obviously if you don't want to leave kids behind, you've got to think holistically about the needs. But you've also got to recognize that the conditions in schools matter. And while we, we, we hold kids, regardless of what kind of schools they go to, accountable to take the same test, we don't educate them under the same conditions. Some of our kids are going to school without basic resources, without teachers that are trained in the fields they're teaching in. The learning opportunities are unequal. And not surprisingly, so are the outcomes. And our policy doesn't address this. We've led, seen a narrowing of the curriculum. So in a lot of schools, anything that's not on the test is increasingly treated as an extra that will be cut right, if the budget gets tight. Again, that's much more likely in an urban district serving low-income kids than it is in an affluent suburb. Right. You don't see them cutting phys ed and recess and art and music out in the suburbs or in the, right, near the lake on right, the North Shore. No. So this is really about equity and the ways in which policy ignores equity, despite the rhetoric. And increasingly what we see is instead what they're doing as policymakers is relying on pressure as a strategy for reform. And if you, anybody's been watching what's happened in Atlanta today with the verdicts against the teachers, 
understands what pressure can do to people. Because right? when you say someone's job is tied to how well the kids do on a test, or whether or not that school will stay open, not only do you create incentive for people to cheat, you also create incentive for people who can to leave. And we're seeing lots and lots of educators who are choosing to work elsewhere because they simply are tired of the pressure. It takes more than pressure to improve schools. It takes more than threats and humiliation. You actually have to figure out what do the schools need and provide the kind of support they need. And if you want to see a, a, a city that has embraced that, go to Toronto. Because Toronto has shown the world that you can serve poor kids, immigrant kids, kids of all different colors and backgrounds, and serve them well if you focus on building capacity in schools. And I always say that, you know, they did that with a crack-smoking mayor, right? <laughs> right? Imagine if they had a sober mayor, right, what they could have accomplished, right? I mean, it's a different framework and a different way of thinking about results. And one of the things that happens in this country, we don't learn from other models of success. So we've got to also understand that this test-based accountability has also impacted teaching and learning. And we're seeing this in lots of schools. We're seeing too much scripted curriculum. Why? Because we don't trust the teachers. Or because the teachers are too inex inexperienced to know how to teach without a script. And therefore, we're seeing lots of kids bored to death because the script doesn't allow for a lot of creativity and critical thinking. And what's more, the standards that are testable often don't get at the higher order thinking. Now, the Common Core is supposed to address that. I'm going to talk about that more because I do see it as an opportunity. The problem is that the Common Core has been linked to these high stakes tests, which have been implemented even before the kids have even been prepared. And our policymakers don't get it that raising the standards is the easy part. The hard work is figuring out how to make the standards accessible to kids, all kinds of kids. And there's not a state in the country right now that's figured out how to do that. And that's part of the debate about the Common Core that's not really come to light nearly enough. And so consequently, what we're seeing is too many schools that are not engaged in deeper learning Instead, what they're focused on is, is um, monitoring achievement, uh, monitoring teachers. You've got curriculum police in schools. They don't call them police. But they want to make sure you're on the right page on the right day. And again, driving out our most creative teachers in many cases. Because our best teachers, or many teachers, do not go into the profession simply to follow a script. <clears throat> and most of all, this approach to test-based accountability is having a really negative impact on our most vulnerable kids. And I mean kids with learning disabilities, English language learners, kids who are coming from homes and families in distress or where there's simply not enough parent parental support. Because so much of learning, it has to be reinforced at home. And consequently, we're seeing lots and lots of kids, despite all the rhetoric and all the the, the initiatives coming out of Washington and coming out of state capitals, we're not seeing the schools that need to improve moving forward, not in the ways they should. So I want to be clear about this because it's very easy to distort a message. I don't believe that poverty is a learning disability. I don't believe that poor kids can't learn. I have ample evidence they can. I'm going to show you examples of schools where, in fact, they're not only learning, they're thriving. I do believe that if you ignore poverty, and all the conditions related to it, chances are most of the kids with the greatest needs will not succeed. Not because they can't, but because they haven't even been given the chance. We've got to focus on the opportunity to learn. And that opportunity has got to be rooted in a recognition of who those kids are and what they need to have a chance to be successful. And if we don't do that, we will continue to see the kids with the greatest needs most likely to fail. So the framework that I, <clears throat> I've been drawing upon, along with some colleagues, to do this deeper learning work with the equity and focus starts from recognizing like, what I said earlier about child development. That is that we've got to understand the developmental needs of kids. We've got to understand you can't separate the 
intellectual development from the emotional and the social and the physical, it all occurs in the same person. And part of that means, again, recognizing that not all kids do things in the same ways or, or will at the same pace. Sounds obvious, right? Except that's not reflected in our policies and practices in many schools today. It also draws on research from the neurosciences which are showing us that the brain is elastic, it's like a muscle, it's not fixed, and can continue to grow with stimulation, and challenge, and support. This is true of all kinds of brains. Autistic children, right? all kinds, with the right support, can learn and grow and develop. And that's what we've got to focus on, is how do we provide the support our kids need throughout their time in school. Right? But again, and most importantly, during early childhood. Because so much of that brain development, I'm going to show you in a moment, starts at the foundation of infancy. And if we don't provide the support, then it's very hard to undo some of the damage that is often inflicted upon children. And lastly, we've got to understand the context in which kids are growing up in. What's happening in their lives outside of school? Who's in the family? <clears throat> Who's providing care to those kids when they're not with you? What are the peer influences like? Because all those things also impact development in a child. And if we're not aware of that context, then what ends up happening is as kids get older, we lose the kids to the streets. And how many of you have seen that? Kids who are fine in elementary school, hit middle school, they're a different person, because they are. And they have to make different choices. And so we need schools that are responsive to our children, which means they need a different framework that focuses on much more than simply academic achievement as measured by a test score. So I just want to briefly point out what the research has shown us about toxic stress in the environment. Right? And Chicago's got a lot. Right? And toxic stress is known now, and if you want to look up the research by Sibel Raver and others with the Child Study, uh, Study Project, they've been studying Chicago children over several years. And what they're finding is that children exposed to high levels of poverty for long periods of time have trouble with attention, working memory, and inhibition control. Those are our kids. And what we know now is that if we ignore those needs, the stressors start to impact children over time and affect and often limit their ability to learn, particularly as they get older. This is um, just a comparison of the exposure to trauma amongst returning veterans and children in Detroit. And what you'd see is that on several of these, combat, fire, explosion, rape, sexual assault, the rates are higher in Detroit than amongst returning veterans. Many of our schools lack the resources to respond to this kind of trauma. But this is impacting our kids, and it's affecting learning outcomes. And again, I'm not trying to say that we want to use this as an excuse for why we can't teach kids, but we simply have to know who we're teaching and what we're up against. Otherwise, what we'll find is the kids who are exposed to the most, and this is, you should recognize this map, right? and the, um, the reds are homicides. Right? And kids who are exposed to violence are often experiencing trauma. And if they're three and four, they may not be able to tell you that they're experiencing trauma, but they might have trouble concentrating. And they might have trouble sitting still. And responding to that with punishment, as we often do in school, is unlikely to change the behavior. In fact, it might make it worse. So understanding the context in which we work, understanding how children are affected by that context is an important part of doing this work well. And I would say right now that we spend not nearly enough time understanding what's going on in the communities where our children live and the challenges they face, and thinking creatively about how to respond to those challenges. Now, you have great research here in Chicago, came out of the University of Chicago, about the five essential ingredients of school improvement. And it was based on 10 years of research studying the changes that occurred here, largely under Arne Duncan's leadership. And the questions they asked was, why did some schools get better while others didn't? And what did they find? They find, well, the ones that improved had these five essential ingredients in common. And when you look down the list, a coherent instructional guidance system, 
That means teachers aren't doing their own thing. They actually have support. There's a plan. There's a strategy. Ongoing development of the professional capacity of the staff. Why? Because no matter what, me what school of education you went to, you don't graduate a master teacher who's ready to take on any child. And if you don't develop the skills in an ongoing way, you'll find that teachers simply don't have the skills to match the needs of the students. Third, strong parent community ties, particularly because community often has resources that can help in addressing some of the social and economic issues. Fourth, a student-centered learning climate, because culture matters. Right? The relationships matter, and they impact whether or not that environment is conducive to teaching and learning. And lastly, leadership. Leadership that can sustain and support educators in the work of producing change in the schools. Now when you look at the list, does any of that shock you? Does any of that seem like, wow, I never thought that that would be important? Right? Right. What's shocking is why is this not reflected in our policies? Why is this not guiding the Chicago public schools right now? When they look at a school that's struggling, they should just look down the list. Well, how are they doing on number one? Ah, they don't have a good instructional guidance. Maybe that's what we should help them do, is to get that. That is, this is actually a framework for how to look at schools and build capacity. In fact, it's being used by the University of Chicago like that now in other districts. I would suggest they do it in their own backyard. I would suggest that Arnie Duncan talk to John Easton, who helped write the report, and say, wow, maybe Race for the Top should have suggested that, instead of saying, fire half the teachers if a school's not improving. So this language right here, and this gets right at the heart of what I want to focus on, about expanding access to high standards. This is the language of the Common Core. This is the language right here. And what does it say in the language arts? You've got to create a staircase of increasingly complex text. Students are expected to develop both their literacy skills and apply them in more, to, to more complex texts. The standards require students to systematically acquire knowledge in literature and other disciplines through reading, writing, speaking, and listening. English teachers still teach their students the literature and literary nonfiction text that they choose, not prescribed. However, because college and career readiness overwhelmingly focuses on complex texts outside of literature, the standards are also, also ensure that students are being prepared to read, write, and research across the curriculum, including in history and science. You want to see an excellent explanation for, on this from one of your own brilliant scholars? Carol Lee has a great video you can look up online of a lecture she did about the Common Core and teaching it to a variety of learners in the language arts. So how, what happens when you actually do this? This is what it looks like. This is Brockton High School. Brockton High School is the largest high school in the state of Massachusetts, over 4,000 students. At a time when other schools were going small because they got Gates grants to go small, they said, no, we're staying large, because it's large schools have more resources. And at a time when other schools in Massachusetts were under great pressure to pass those high stakes exams, and Massachusetts has the most rigorous exams in the country. And districts like Boston and, and Lawrence and Lynn and Springfield were putting their kids through test prep, Kaplan courses. Brockton said, we're going to go differently. A group of veteran teachers came to the principal, Sue Satchewitz, and said, you know what our kids need? They need to learn to read and write. That's what they need. Because too many are coming to high school reading at third and fourth grade level. So she said, well, that's good, but I don't have any money to do that. She said, no problem. We will train our colleagues. She said, well, I can't make the, anybody do this. She said, we will work with the willing. So on their own and on their own time, at lunchtime, after school, prep time, they start training their colleagues on how to teach literacy across the curriculum. And it's different in science than it is in math, than it is in English or history, so it had to be tailored to the subject matter. By 2006, 80% of the kids were passing the test. Got everybody's attention. By 2009, 95% of the kids at Brockton High School passing the test. For the last four years, one third of the senior class has gotten the highest possible score and is entitled to an Adams Scholarship. That means a free public a scholarship at any public university. 
If you could see the picture, you would notice that over a third are African American, a third are Latino, a third are low income white. It completely matches the demographics of the school. Now, Brockton is the only, well, one of two urban high schools in the state that gets a level one rating. All the other level one rated high schools in Massachusetts are in wealthy communities. And it's showing us that by focusing like a laser on what the kids need and training teachers to meet those needs, you can get great results. They're not alone. <coughs> oh, these are, if you were interested in advertisement, <laughs> interested in multicultural literature, like literature that matches the backgrounds of kids, and guess what? Our kids don't get to see themselves in the books they're asked to read. Get Lee and Lowe Books, the only producer of multicultural literature right now in the country, right? That's why I give them a plug. <laughs> the math standards, what are they asked? The standards are designed to support a student's ability to learn and apply more demanding math concepts and procedures. The middle school and high school standards call on students to practice applying mathematical ways of thinking to real world issues and challenges. In particular, problem solving, collaboration, communication and critical thinking skills are interwoven into the standard. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Sounds like it takes some really high power teaching. Yep, well you're right, it does. And here it is, happening right there in Hollenbeck Middle School in East LA, which all of these kids are poor, all of these kids are uh, recent immigrants, and they're in a 90 minute math class. 90 minutes. And look at them, they're up out of their seats. And that teacher is so good, she could stand in the back and talk to me. Right? If she wanted to, she could do yoga in the background because the kids are in control of learning. And because the kids are in control, she gets to move amongst the kids to see who's on it, who's not, who needs more help, who doesn't. That's the only way in which you can differentiate instruction. Who are the teachers that know how to do this with these kinds of kids? If we don't hold them up and shine a light on them, guess what's gonna happen as you implement the Common Core? The easiest way to teach is the hardest way to learn. What's the easiest way to teach? Stand and talk. Right? But guess what? Teaching and talking are not the same. Teaching and covering the material are not the same. If there's no evidence of learning, no evidence of really being taught. At this school, Think about the planning that went into that classroom. Because the kids are not, nearly, not simply learning the math, they're learning how to work together, how to collaborate. They're learning how to help each other. And what impressed me is they were so immersed in the work that when the bell rang, they got up like they were disturbed. They weren't packing up five minutes before. Who are the teachers that know how to do this in Chicago? And how do we make sure that other teachers get a chance to learn from them? Because this isn't easy. Might look easy, but getting to that point, and some teachers look at that, they get scared. Because they know that chaos is around the corner. Right? Someone could fart and the whole class get thrown off, right? <laughs> right? Not easy. English language learners and students with learning disabilities, they gotta learn the Common Core too. This is what it says. It says, in order for L's and students with disabilities <clears throat> to meet high academic standards, they must acquire conceptual and procedural knowledge and skills in mathematics, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. For this to occur, their instructions must include support services designed to meet their unique needs, fidelity in the implementation of the IEP, <clears throat> teachers and specialized instructional support personnel who are prepared and qualified to deliver high-quality, evidence-based, individualized instruction support services. Now, like so many things that come out of the federal government and elsewhere, this sounds, yeah, right. right. How do you do that? Well, guess what? They figured out how to do it in the Bronx. They figured out how to do it at the Bronx Academy of Language and Technology. Those kids in that picture are all students with interrupted formal education. What does that mean? It means they don't even speak, they're not even literate in their native language because they weren't going to school regularly in their home country. They come to this country high school age, some of them overaged, and over 40% of them undocumented. 
So what did the school do? The school said, well, guess what? In that case, every teacher has to be a teacher of L's. We're not going to have a specialist. Every teacher is a specialist. And because a third of their teachers are new teachers, they say, well, guess what? We can just stick a new teacher in the classroom with these kids. So every period, there's not a single lesson delivered to a student that hasn't been planned collectively and vetted before it's used. Teachers plan lessons together. I sat in a meeting where a veteran teacher's leading a group of newer teachers on planning lessons. I said, this is great. You guys do this all the time? They said, we do it every day. And one of the teachers turned to me and says, don't all teachers do this? I said, no, they don't. And he was like, oh man, I, why am I at this school? <laughs> you know? but, but they actually appreciated the support. And I asked the kids at this school, I said, what makes this school so special? Because 95% of the kids at this school are graduating right, with six regions in English, too. You know what the kids told me? They said, it feels like a family. Feels like family. Feels like people here are got my back. People are, this is where I get support. I want to be here. How often do you hear that from kids? I want to be there. That's the kind of place I want to learn in. So they're doing it in the South Bronx. Now, I could name lots of other schools in the South Bronx and elsewhere where they're not doing it. Where kids like that are dropping out in droves. In fact, a lot of what I do, especially in New York, is I take educators who are in struggling schools and take them to schools like these. I say, you need to see where it's being done. Because sometimes if you can't see it's, that it can be done, you start to think, you know what? Problem is those kids. And maybe if I had different kids, I'd get better results. And that mindset is not unlike those who say, you know, the problem is those teachers. Blaming teachers, blaming kids, blaming parents is not going to get us anywhere. We've got to figure out how do we do this work differently to get better results. And there are examples out there that we've got to learn from. And those schools that are doing this, this higher, <clears throat> this more powerful, deeper learning, and with it goes powerful teaching, are focused on engagement. They're focused on getting kids excited about learning. That's why we say, you know what, don't focus on achievement. Focusing on achievement is the wrong issue. Get kids excited about learning. You can get kids excited about learning, invested as learners, everything is easier, isn't it? Because right. they actually, now you have a willing participant in education, rather than someone you're trying to force feed. Really hard to make someone learn. I've tried it. It doesn't work too well. And, be, and engagement is multidimensional. It includes behavioral engagement, engagement that is, do they know how to do school? Do they show up? Are they prepared? It includes cognitive engagement. Or do they process the information? Do they know what question to ask? And it includes emotional engagement. Do they care? Right. Does it matter to them? And if we're not addressing engagement, then the whole job gets harder, much, much harder. I was at a school also in the Bronx in January, one of the coldest days of the year in New York. You know about cold, right? And I get there first period, and I see kids bundling up to go outside. I said, where are you guys going? It's freezing. They said, we're studying. We have to go collect samples from the Bronx River. This is in their chemistry class. I said, I asked them, why are you collecting the samples? They said, we're, we're tracking what pollutants are in the river. We're tracking what plant life is in the river. And we are also looking at animal life in the river. And one of the kids showed me a picture of two beavers in the Bronx River. Beavers. They said they were gay beavers. They were both male. <laughs> Amazing. The kids are excited about going outside, and they're excited about the science. The teacher could have simply just stayed inside and shown the textbook and forgot about all the river and the beavers and all that. But she realized, no, if she wants these kids to actually be motivated to do the science, she's got to do more. And fortunately, she's at a school where the principal lets them go outside. Right. And that's OK, because <laughs> the principal gets it too. So engagement really, really matters a lot. We have lots of evidence from the research now of the kinds of teaching strategies that elicit deeper engagement from kids. Active learning, interactive classrooms, drawing on the prior knowledge of a student. Because right. we don't teach kids with empty heads. Personalized learning plans, inquiry-based pedagogical strategies, simulations, experiential learning, Socratic seminars and debate, project-based learning.
There are 28 schools in New York City that do performance-based assessment. My daughter went to one of them, School of the Future in Manhattan. These are public schools. Kids have to do an exhibition each year in a different subject matter. And they work on that exhibition with the teacher in small groups all year long. In ninth grade, my daughter did a, her exhibition for history was on the Inca and the Roman Empire. She wanted to know why they rose, how they rose, why they eventually collapsed. She had to understand the politics, the economy, culture, religion. She had to have multiple sources. She had to have a thesis statement. End of the year, she has a 25-page research paper as a ninth grader. But producing the paper is not good enough because then she has to go and present her work to teachers, students, and parents. And at the presentation, there's only three grades possible. Distinction for those who nailed it, competence for those who get by, do-over for those who don't. Failure, not an option. And do-over is no fun, because that means summer. And they have English language learners and kids with special needs going through the same process. They have found ways to make high standards accessible. That's the goal. It's an equity issue. So in those schools, teachers are focused on evidence. And that's why at those schools, kids learn through revise and submit, right? Because you don't do your, first work, your best work on the first um, sample, right? On the first attempt. The real learning is in the revision. And the real teaching is in the feedback, not the grade. And it, you know, you, there's so much talk now about grit and the importance of teaching grit. You know, I always say that grit, you, don't even see, you want to see somebody with grit? Watch the guys who deliver food in the snow on their bikes, right? They got a lot of grit. They, they, I don't, that's a rough job out there. But guess what? All the grit in the world, and they're still riding bikes. Because grit without opportunity leaves you broke. It's not simply about hard work. It's about expanding opportunities and giving our kids clear signs of what it takes to improve. And if we don't do that for our kids, even if they're trying hard, you will still see kids like the, my student, Jaime Aquino. Jaime Aquino graduated valedictorian from his high school in San Francisco. Got to UC Berkeley, had to take remedial everything. He was invited back to his high school. When he was about to graduate from Berkeley, he'd been admitted to Yale Medical School. Gets back there, they want to celebrate him. And he told his teachers, you didn't prepare me for Berkeley. I was in there way over my head. You left, I was, I was left with the false impression that I actually was prepared because I had all A's. We can't set our kids up to fail. And so we've got to be clear what the standards are and how to get there. And I know this is hard work. It's, it's hard for all the reasons I said already. It's hard because we're working with kids with high needs. It's hard because the policies are so distorted and, and make things so difficult. But the examples I'm citing right now are schools that are showing that, yeah, even within those constraints, it's possible to get things done. And that's what I'd encourage you to think about. How do we ensure that we're working with integrity, that we're, that we're not lowering the bar, you know, if you, if you let kids know that you will accept slop and pass them, what will happen? They'll keep giving you slop. They will. They say, oh, you like slop? I could do this all day. Here you go. Here's some more. Those are the kids who care enough to give you something. They're the kids who don't even care because they've been conditioned not to care. And if we don't figure out how to get them to care again, it's going to be very hard to change, change the outcomes. So we've got to do a lot to support our teachers, because this kind of work requires more from teachers. And we've got to provide particularly new teachers. You know, this idea of taking new teachers, that whether they come from any college in the area or Teach for America, and giving the most challenging kids to teach, show me the research to support that strategy. There is none. It's a bad idea. And so we need to provide mentors. We need to make sure that new teachers get lots and lots of support. Otherwise, we will simply burn them out, and they'll be gone within a year or two. And that's what we're seeing across the country right now. We need to make sure there's time to plan. We need to make sure there's time for observation and feedback. <clears throat> and we need to make sure that we're using the research again, the research from neuroscience about how people learn. Uh, kids learn best when not, mistakes are not held against them. 
They learn best when they can actually apply what they're learning, learn by doing, and they learn best when they can experience mastery along the way. I'll go faster. <laughs> Relationships. You know, it sounds trite, but they matter. Right? Kids who think that the adults who are teaching them care about them, and I'm, I should add this, that our most vulnerable kids are even more dependent on relationships. They need to know the teacher cares about them. They need to know the teacher's interested. It actually buffers them from the effects of trauma to know there's a caring adult who is worried about their welfare, who's checking in and saying, how's it going? Even if that adult can't save them from the difficulties out there, they at least know there's someone at school who's actually interested in me and what's happening in my life. So ultimately, what we really need is to shift the whole way we're thinking about education. And I know that's probably a ways off. But I'm seeing a different paradigm in place in pockets. They're not looking at intelligence as innate. They're seeing it as being influenced by opportunity. They're not focused on measuring and sorting kids by their ability. Instead, they're focused on cultivating talent and strength in kids. They're not expecting the kids to adjust to the expectation of the school. They're organizing the school to meet the needs of the kids. They're flipping the whole relationship. And they're not using discipline to weed out the bad kids. They're using discipline to reinforce values and norms that lead to individuals who can become self-disciplined. It's a different way of thinking about our work. And there are individuals out there who I know, they've already been doing these things. But we need to figure out ways to have that kind of work happening on a much larger scale if we're going to change outcomes for a greater number of kids. And that means also putting in place systems like diagnostic assessment, right, so we can really figure out what kids need and address it and be responsive. Early intervention, right? Wow, isn't that a brilliant idea? Rather than late intervention? Right. All right, makes sense, doesn't it? Ongoing evaluation of programs to make sure they actually do what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> Shared leadership in schools, and then looking at the culture of the schools to make sure these are places that are really conducive to good teaching and learning. So there's a lot we need to do to change policy, right? We need to focus on broadening and deepening the curriculum and learning opportunities for kids. We need to move away from scripted teaching so we keep the creativity of teaching alive, right? That's what makes teaching a, a powerful profession. We need to ensure that those opportunities are available to kids. Uh, we need to do things that will make our schools places where kids are actually excited and happy to be. And, and, and so that capacity building framework, I would say, has to be at the heart of this effort. If you're serious about creating neighborhood schools in Chicago, where kids will want to be, then they're going to have to focus on safety and mentorship. They're going to have to focus on nutrition. They're going to have to extend learning opportunities for kids because the school day is not enough for a lot of them. They're going to have to engage the parents. And they're going to have to make sure that the teachers get plenty of support because the work is hard. Let me close with this. I was very active in the anti-apartheid movement as a student. And finally got to go to South Africa a few years ago. I've been going back several times since then. And on one of those visits, I got to go to Robben Island. Robben Island was the maximum security prison where many of the leaders of the ANC were held, including Nelson Mandela. Got to see Mandela's cell, right? And see that he slept on a, with, a, with a blanket on a concrete floor. And the tour is given by former inmates, right? Who would tell you what life was like and how hard it was. And this one um, tour guide explains to me, he says, you know, that we, the, 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 this prison was designed to break us, and it became known as the ANC's University. I said, the ANC's University? How do you do that? I said, this is where the leadership of the revolution was being developed. And we were sharing information and passing on, uh, on, on, on educating each other, because we knew we were preparing a leadership that would take over after apartheid fell. And they explained the whole process in which they had people like Dennis Brutus, who some of you may know was a poet, used to recite poetry to, to other inmates and, 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 and Shakespeare that he'd memorized by heart. And, and, and guards, including Mandela's guard, who became his ally and would smuggle in books. 
And I thought, wow, if you could turn a prison into a university, maybe we could turn schools into schools, right? <laughs> maybe we could make schools places where kids are actually excited about learning, where teachers are supported and really see the work as intellectual work. I think that's possible. Thank you.